to this talk about testing async components. I'm Alex Krolik, I work at Box, and in my spare time, I help out with React testing library. Um, before we get into timers, promises, and API calls, I want to do a quick recap of component testing 101. So what that looks like is you'll have a UI element, and you'll go through three phases, the range, act, assert steps. So in testing library terms, that's render the component, then find elements and fire events on them, and then use your expectations to do assertions about the final state. So for this example, we have a comment box. And we're going to pass in an on submit prop that's a just mock function um, into its uh, on submit handler. Then we're going to find this uh, element, the uh, text box element. We're going to enter a value into it. Then we're going to click submit. And then finally, we are going to move into the uh, assertion phase and we're going to assure that our uh, our click handler has been our submit handler has been called with the right data and that our text uh, submitted has appeared in the document um, one thing you'll note is that we're not using act here because react testing library wraps fire event with act automatically so any effects that are generated there um, and micro tasks are cleaned up by react and rendered before we move on to the next step of the test um, the difference between this component and components in a real app is that it was fully synchronous. So there was no delays, everything happened immediately. Whereas a real test is full of sources of asynchronicity. From timers, promises, and networks, um, you're going to see animations, browser APIs are going to be using promises, and everything is basically async all of the time. So I'm going to walk through each of those three elements, uh, timers, promises, and network, and talk about how you can deal with them. So first, timers. I'm going to extend that previous example a little bit and say that we've debounced the change handler for the input box that's inside of this comment uh, modal form thing. So what a debounce does is it makes sure that the function isn't called until the user stops interacting with the thing. So um, we're now at a 200 millisecond delay to prevent that change handler from being called in every single key press. That will affect our test because we can no longer immediately click that button after we stop typing because we're waiting for that delay to kick in. So what do we do about it? Strategy one, we just get rid of the timer completely. So we can find anywhere in our code that has a timeout and replace that constant with a zero. Um, and the other thing that we can do is mock out any functions that are creating timers, i.e. the low dash uh, debounce function, and replace it with a mock function that we can then assert about. So since Ludash debounce is fairly uh, well tested and we, we kind of trust it to work, this is a pretty good candidate for it because we can say, was that function debounced? Was that callback debounced? Yes, uh, because of this, uh, this mock, but we don't care about the actual implementation of that code running. So it doesn't affect our test anymore. It's no longer asynchronous. Um, the other strategy that we can do is we can use fake timers, meaning it's like driving a stick shift. You're taking full control of the test and all the time inside of it. So uh, the way that Jest handles it, and there's an equivalent sign on, is that there's an API called fake timers. Uh, Jest use fake timers starts it. Um, and every time you want to advance time, you have to call one of the APIs. It's either run all timers, which runs every timer that has been created, or advance timers by a time, and that will uh, allow it to move forward just only by that specific amount. So in our test, after our change, after we're triggering that uh, text box's change event, um, we would advance the, the time by our debounce amount in milliseconds. And then after that, we could finally click the button. The disadvantage of this is that if you have uh, advanced timers by time or runoff timers all over the place in your test, it gets a little bit hard to manage because um, now you have to know everywhere that uh, potential asynchronicity is happening and kind of manually work around it. And it can you kind of end up with manual time and control all over the place if this is something you use wildly. So um, the alternative, and this is kind of the preferred te testing library pattern and something that's very much enabled by testing library APIs, is to make the whole test async. And then if you want to do uh, any optimizations, around uh, individual debounces or anything like that, you can, but anything small is gonna be glossed over, um, single ticks or 20, 20 100 milliseconds, um, that'll, that'll go off without a hiccup in the test. So the big differences in how you write a test that's async versus synchronous are, are these. 
So first, um, you've got to rewrite your test to await syntax. Uh, so by changing it to an async function, you can then use await anywhere, which kind of resembles a synchronous thing, uh, but it's actually using promises under the hood. And then the big difference is that anywhere where you think that you may have something that's going to take a certain amount of time or a certain amount of ticks, you want to replace that manual wait, like, you know, wait 200 milliseconds or uh, advanced time or 200 milliseconds with an assertion about the, f the next step um, and when it's ready to proceed. So in this case, what we can say is that that button is disabled while the input box is empty. But once we type a value in there, it'll become enabled. Um, so what we can say is we can add this little assertion inside of the wait for callback that expects that button to not be disabled. And then after that becomes true, we'll be able to move on to clicking it. Um, so that's just a retriable assertion that signals to us when we can continue the test. Um, if the assertion that we're talking about is that an element is appearing, we have a shortcut, which is that we can replace any get by queries with find by queries. So we're replacing our get by text with a find by text, which is an awaitable assertion that we'll retry until that element is in the DOM. This pattern is basically what you're gonna use for promises as well as most timers. Um, it works pretty well in both scenarios. So if you have promises, the first thing you're gonna do, rewrite async test. But the big difference between a timer test and something that's dealing with promises, that promises typically affect control flow. So the code needs to be testing both the resolve path and the reject path. So uh, just mock functions can do that for you. So if I have a mock function like the one we passed in on submit, what we can do is we can say mock rejected value once. That'll uh, say that when that function is called, it's going to return a rejected promise with this data, which is a 500 status code, a server side error. Um, and then we can have our async find by text query that's looking for that server error uh, to be shown to the user in the DOM. Um, now moving on, our final source of asynchronicity is the big one the actual network. So in a test, you really don't want to be hitting real servers because for one, they're unreliable. Um, you don't want your front end test code to be totally reliant on the entire back end system. And for a variety of reasons, you might not actually be able to access it. And then of course, as we just shown, there's a good chance that we're also want to, wanting to be able to test, uh, you know, error, error paths or bad data being passed in. And finally, of course, it could be pretty slow. So the way we can deal with network API calls in a unit test, um, first approach, take whatever interface that we're using to call the API and mock it. Usually they have a promise-based interface, so we just use the same patterns that we've been using. Um, so if we were using window fetch, we replace that with the mock function, and then we treat it like a regular promise. Anywhere that we want to call um, that API, we replace the value um, with some data that we've uh, mocked out, and then we respond to the mocked results normally. Um, if we want to pass in bad data, we change it to a rejected. The downside of this approach, if we change our mind about using window fetch, we change it to Axios or something. Um, now we kind of have to rewrite all of our tests to conform to that new test, uh, a new data format. So if, for example, fetch, you always have to call res JSON. Um, do you want to mock out you know, the JSON methods on all this stuff? Not necessarily. Um, so it might be kind of over constraining your test a little bit if you're always using these interfaces. But to get started, if you just have a few calls that you need to mock out, this is definitely a way you can do it. A bit more sophisticated approach is that we could actually mock out a fake server. So there's a few libraries that I am aware of. So Mock Service Worker and Mirage JS, they both seem to work fairly similarly. And the idea is that you have a service worker that can intercept calls to certain routes and then replace them with fake responses. So in this example, which I pulled from the testing library docs, um, we uh, set up a server that is responding to this greeting route and it's sending back a bad, uh, bad status code of 500. So every time somebody calls slash greeting, that's what they're gonna get back. And then in different tests, you can change the response to something else. Um, this works pretty well. The only real downside here is that now we're kind of coupled to the network interface rather than the specific library. So potentially if we're thinking about refactoring big chunks of the app,
um, we may want to have some kind of abstraction between our actual network calls and what we're doing in the app. So here's how you could do that. So creating an API module is as simple as creating a file. Let's call it API.js. And then you put all of your code that deals with the network in there. So in this case, we've got something called get user. That's an async function, takes an ID, and then it does window fetch for a certain endpoint. If we later replace that with a different library or we introduce something, uh, some response handling in there, or even rewrite it to hit a GraphQL endpoint instead, this will keep working because the app code is insulated from that. At the same time, the way that we use our tests, uh, we use this module in our tests is we can generate, create mock from module, which will take all of these functions and replace them with mock functions. And then we can say, okay, get user, let's change the value to return, say, an uh, unauthenticated status code, uh, 401. Or we could change it to return our actual user data. Um, the downside with that, again, is that now we kind of have created this additional interface here. So we do have to both unit test it and validate that it actually is correct. Um, and then also, if you're working with state management code that is uh, very intelligent, that makes API calls on your behalf, it's not necessarily going to want to go through this intermediary module. So um, so for certain of these like very intelligent um, new libraries, that might not be the way to go. So that said, we've been talking about just, we've been talking about unit tests. I'm going to be talking about the downfalls where uh, interfaces can kind of not be quite right between what we thought we were testing and what actually happens when we build the app. So sometimes testing in a real browser in an end-to-end -end testing scenario is the way to go. Cypress is a pretty good library for that. Um, cool thing about Cypress is that all of its uh, assertions, all of its uh, queries for elements are already async. So more than the get queries, they resemble the find by queries in React testing library. Um, so the built-in .get .contains methods, um, they're async. So they'll retry until that element exists, which is very good if you have asynchronous code anywhere. Um, if you want to use the exact queries the testing library exposes, the role query, for example, an accessible assertion, uh, or an accessible query, um, or label text, or placeholder, or anything like that. We have a plugin called Testing Library Cypress, and you can then use uh, all of those commands as well, and they behave in the exact same way. Um, if you do decide that that intent test maybe has a few paths that you weren't able to test, maybe you want to test errors or something, you can do network mocking in Cypress too. So they've iterated through this API a few times, but where they've settled now is called Cypress Intercept. In older versions, it was called route or route two, um, but they are acting very similarly to the service worker uh, methodology that we were talking about before, where you say an individual route, and then when it's called certain arguments, it returns certain values. So very powerful, very useful. Um, and ultimately, um, you have kind of a, a whole suite of options available to you as far as testing all this steps, all this code. So that's pretty much everything I have. I'm hoping that these uh, techniques were useful to you. If you want to read more, there are up-to-date guides on the testinglibrary.com website, as well as reactjs.org and justjs.io. If you want to get in touch with me, my website is alexcrowlick.com and I get uh, also alexcrowlick. Thank you so much. <laughs>